Frank J. Avella with Awards Daily. Diego Vizzatini's Simone exposes the fraught situation in Venezuela by focusing his narrative on one freedom fighter's journey. The film was one of two being considered for that country's Oscar submission, but was not selected. Welcome, Diego. Hi, right, thanks. Thanks for having me, Frank. Thank you for coming on. Um, first of all, congratulations on the Goya Award nomination. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we're still processing the news. I'm assuming that um, the Venezuelan Academy is different from um, ANAC? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the, the basic gist is the, yeah, the Venezuelan Academy is just filmmakers. So it's independent, you know, we they have their platform, they view it, and then they just vote online wherever they are in the world. So it's, you know, pretty just democratic and among filmmakers. The other does go through the government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let let's let's speak a little bit about that. Um, you know, kind of rip the band-aid off. Uh, yeah. I read the complaint about the selection process. Can you try to simplify it for everybody? Uh, tell us about the selection process and why you decided to speak out against about it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as you said, there was basically two films that were up for contending for for the Oscar uh, submission from from Venezuela. So it was our movie and another movie. And the process is there's a selection committee chosen, and this year it was 24 people. And we had people that we knew that were in that uh, committee to select the film. And once the selection process occurred, we basically started receiving uh, notifications and, and um, about irregularities in the process of selection with just some outright uh, rules that were broken in the process which were to our detriment um and then yeah deciding to speak out about it is one not because it was a surprise but because we you know we've been 24 years living under this authoritarian regime and it's thing after thing with literal actual elections presidential elections to any other sort of realm in, in a country where there everything happens with impunity where the government just does what it does uh with absolute uh, with just rampant corruption and 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 impunity so we just think it's upon ourselves to at least announce these things when they happen that there is some sort of uh, visibility and it's said even if the outcome doesn't change you know th this is part of the like the push and e you know even the spirit of the movie of like just keep, keep on keep that ongoing fight happening um, and this it, you know it's almost surreal that you know, you make a movie sort of about that, and then it's like living its own story. And then now through like the film world, even that it gets tainted and you still have to like speak up and, and fight for all these injustices. Um, Cause we also just want to be representatives of the way we wish or want our country to work where things are just done properly. Cause you know, if we didn't get selected and things were like nor done normally, then okay, we could just have differing opinions about which movie we thought had a better chance, but at least for the process to occur with regularity. Well, and it gets even more surreal and, and complicated because the film actually played in Venezuela. Uh, although that, it had a little bit of a difficult journey there too. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, but I mean, well, uh, I, as a Venezuelan, if you say it was a difficult journey, I'd say it wasn't difficult at all because we're used to, like I expected it to be censored since I started like writing the first sentence in the on the script. In fact, you know, I wrote it assuming it was going to be censored. So I like didn't worry about like, oh, do I have to be subtle in my critique? Like, no, no, I'm good. I mean, the subject matter is directly denouncing all these crimes against humanity and, and torture. Um, so I assumed it was going to be censored. It wouldn't play in Venezuela. And that was like, and with the producers, like we had assumed that. Um, and our plan with like distributing the movie was always like, okay, all the other countries, how are we going to do that? Assuming Venezuela wasn't going to be a thing. Um, nevertheless, we took the steps to a lot to that you would have to do every Venezuelan movie has the right to at least play two weeks in theaters and you know we're like all right we're not going to censor ourselves and not even try let's like do the paperwork and see where they're going to stop us where they're going to like uh censor it or, or whatever um so the first thing was getting the certificate of nationality of the film which does go through CNAC CNAC which is another it's like the governmental institution of of cinematography of of cinema and I mean, honestly, like you said, I guess for a normal country in democracy, like it was harder than they asked for some ridiculous. I mean, 
So that's just to verify that the filmmakers are Venezuelan, the directors, at least Venezuelan, half of the crew is Venezuelan, you know, simple stuff. And we had all the requirements, but they were asking like, uh, can you send us the permit for filming in the Metro Mover in Miami? Like stuff that has nothing to do with like the nationality of the film. But, you know, they asked us all this stuff, but we just we, we had it all. I thought they were even going to be like more like or just keep the paperwork going forever. But at one point they they just they sent us the approval that it is a Venezuelan film, which sounds ridiculous to have to like be worried about that. Um, but in that certificate, they put a clause that said something like, notwithstanding, we deem the content of this movie to be to possibly be in violation of the law against hate and peaceful cohabitation and tolerance of Article 20, which is 10 to 20 years in jail. Mm. Um, and coincidentally, like as a reference, six days ago, they arrested a, a journalist for that same law against hate for tweeting something against the government. So, you know, it, it's like a, it's a standard practice in Cuba and Venezuela that law against hate because it's very ambiguous. Like you're inciting hate with whatever it is you said, you know. Um, but we did get the certificate. And for us, that was like a big win in a sense because it's like now we can, you know, uh, we can put it in theaters and now they're going to have to shut it down later, not at this point. And it's... Um, and then we we got accepted to play at the Venezuela's most important film festival. This was prior to the release, so nobody had really seen it yet except that institution. And um, you attended, right? Was that your first yeah. time back? Yep. After 13 years, 14 years. Um, wow. But that was because I, I didn't plan on going. I Since I started writing the script, even since the short, I was like, all right, the, doing this means I won't be able to go back to Venezuela, but whatever, I'm I'm willing to make that sacrifice because i i believe in the in the in the film and in cinema and what this can do um but it was like four days before five days before you know we had learned from our experiences in festivals and other festivals that it makes a difference to be there like you don't just send your film like it's like no no you got to be there and like be part of the festival and especially with this film where there's gonna be a lot of pushback from other kinds of pressures for it not to be chosen so i just felt that it was like betraying the spirit of the movie like making this movie hasn't been a physical risk to me because I live in LA and it's like, all right, I get to make it from afar, but it's about all these guys, my generation that's taken that risk that went to the streets. So it was just like, I don't know. It didn't feel right. Like, all right, but I'll stay in LA and I hope they choose my movie. And then that means the judges have to put their name to choose. I don't know. Everybody would have to take some, some risks, but not me. So yeah, I decided to, to go. And, you know, with as many precautions as possible, I went through Colombia. So I went through the border in a car. I didn't announce it on social media. I didn't let the festival know that I was coming. Mm. Um, in fact, talking about that surreality, uh, one of the guys I interviewed to write the script. So one of the like real life Simon, he picked me up from the airport in Colombia and I went into the country with him. So I was like with Simon, him driving in the car, <laughs> like entering Venezuela with the movie in hand. I'm like, oh, this is insane um but it was incredible in the reception but yeah it was also super nerve-wracking like I was sweating cold in the theater I was like what am I doing here like 10 minutes 10 minutes into the 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 movie the projectionist came down he's like look if something happens just let me know okay I'm like what? <laughs> the, the the harder stuff hasn't even happened he's like yeah but there's like people from the ministry of culture here there's like military presence at the festival I don't know just let me know I'm like all right <laughs> so yeah that was the hardest screening to to be at um and then the next day at the press conference, you know, was several movies, so us and other movies, and all the questions were directed at us, all like news channels from the government, and many just like reactive or, uh, yeah, just trying to pick out the movie or attack it. But then the the last one, she brought out the like, oh, we know in your certificate you have the law against hate and thing, and that felt a lot more like like organized, like planned, like that's a document that was sent to us in an email with a good, so it's like, oh, this reporter has the. So that one felt a lot more like planted, like, OK, they're watching, you know, and it's here and they're trying to, you know, intimidate. So that one was like more threatening. And then after that press conference, I talked with somebody there that we trusted and it's been there a lot of years. And I just basically told them I was nervous. I'm like, and granted, that person hadn't seen the movie, so I don't think they quite knew <laughs> what I was talking about. But they're like, look, I know it's been 13 years without going to the country and it's scary, but nothing's gonna happen like you're not nobody's ever been arrested because of a movie it's okay I know it's scary but uh I deal with them every all the time it's all bark no bite I'm like okay that night I still decided to like leave at least I went five hours away to another city just to not be there 
which is really close to the border. And then the next morning, I'm like, I'm already close to the border. Let me just leave. I already like presented the movie. I did a bunch of stuff we wanted to do. And then 10 minutes before crossing into Colombia again, I get a text from that person saying, leave. Don't be here. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the same person. It was like, nothing's mm. going to happen. They're like, yeah, uh, never mind. You should go. And you we almost were... had another film on your hands. Yeah, yeah. We can make the documentary of this thing. But uh, uh, yeah, an, adre- an adrenaline filled last 10 minutes in Venezuela, for sure. <laughs> Uh, so how did it play in Venezuela? Because I've okay. gotten conflicting and reports. Then, so and 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 I think this is all relevant because to me it's also very inspiring. Um, you know the the film the festival deciding to play it. Then the judges. There were five judges, and two of them were basically known pro government people. So it's like it was up to these three guys to to basically. And you know, and and uh, the shadow of the sun was there. So there was like another good movie that it was like easy to just be like no we think it's this one and you know keep your hands clean and like not you know not just make life easier for yourself so it was up to these three guys and they chose the the movie you know we won the festival and i mentioned this to play because all these little things and to me it's like all these little acts of bravery how they built to something bigger so it becomes harder to censor the movie once it's like okay won the most important festival it's doing this um so that that allows us to um well, we had it distributed already. Then I think the Goya apostle, the, the nomination or like the candidacy from Venezuela came. The voting happened. They chose us again. So now it's like, it's the it's the movie going to the Goyas and one of the most important festival before you hit theaters. It's like it, everything becomes progressively harder, at least to censor outright. And then two days, I mean, we had our distributor, another set of brave people that were like, they told me um, months before they're like, I mean, late, they confessed way later on that they were scared, but they're like, look, we're we're not going to censor you like because we're f- afraid and then we're feeding into the system. Like, let them come and shut us down. And they did it before years prior. Um, but they were willing to, like, deal with that. Like, but we're not going to censor you. So that was, like, super amazing from them. And two days before the, the premiere, um, there was a, like, news blew up that a lawyer had like made a claim at the court that we were inciting get violent inciting violence or whatever so that blew up a lot and and whatever but then, then it was super sketchy then the next day that same site that originated everything like took it down and but th- at this point it was all blowing up but it was like yeah there was a lot of speculation about what you know there was even like if that was somebody that acted on their own but then I think it's been clear now, at least toward, to my interpretation, that the government has chosen um, to ignore the movie rather than to attack it, rather than to do anything ignore it. I think that might have been like a solo player and then they're like quickly shut that down because nothing else happened. They took it off the site and then the movie was able to play it. And so and everybody asked me, you know, how how is that possible, whatever. Uh, my interpretation is, is that that they chose to ignore it. I think they've censored movies in the past. It gives them more press. And whatever and all those movies i've seen some that they've censored it's like a subtle thing in the radio playing in the background that sort of hints at the thing like mine is just you know a a, a straight arrow i think one they change strategy of to like not give a press and it becomes so ironic of like the movie against the dictatorship is censored it's like too obvious and if you look at the last two years the average attendance event for audiences in venezuela for venezuelan movies was 5,000 people. Oh, wow. So nothing. Yeah. Like the most successful movie was like 14,000 people. So it's like, I think their bet was like, don't even touch it. Let it play. It'll play for three weeks and then it d- dies down because like nobody's going to the movies post pandemic. The economy has collapsed. Nobody has to barely buy anything. So let alone go to the movies. Now the surprise is that it's the most, uh, we're at a hundred. It, it is the highest grossing percent. Venezuelan film, right? In the last six years, yeah, 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 we're at one hundred and sixteen thousand people wow. through more for three months. But um, yeah, it's one of those things. And even to this day, they have not mentioned the movie. Like the Senac, who who gave us the approval, uh, when we won the festival, you just take a look at their Instagram. They posted about the other movies. Congratulations for best supporting actress. Whatever our movie doesn't exist. They don't mention it. And then we got the candidacy for the Goyas doesn't exist. Now we just won the nomination doesn't exist. There's no mention of anywhere, like anything. And, you know, they'll post like this other Venezuelan movie got into this random festival in New Jersey or something. <laughs> but then also the thing, it doesn't exist. Now, 
all this is super expected. This isn't like some crazy surprise, but it's just so blatant and obvious um, that it's, I, I don't know, we're used to it, I guess, at this point. Um, wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks for all that background. You know, I mean, one of one of the rewarding things um, about seeing so many of these international features is uh, besides experiencing the different cultures, of course, um, but also there's so many films that are exposing the corruption, uh, the human rights violations, in some cases, atrocities happening in certain countries. So can you tell us a little bit about the world Simone lives in and how close it is to the reality in Venezuela yeah. right now? uh it's kind of <laughs> it's almost one-on-one -on -one. uh uh and i hear it a lot in the comments and then the stuff people repost on instagram is just like this is too real for venezuelans you know it's many people are scared to go watch it too just because they're like oh this is gonna touch so many things that are too so personal or so close to reality um i mean the summary we've been since i mean i'm 29 so i've only known this government so it came to power in 99 um so, you know, it's a classic authoritarian regime, slash di dictatorship, whatever name you want to call it. I mean, it's a it's a government that's progressively taken over news outlets and private companies and everything. And 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 now people I mean, here's just a clear example. If I get a call to for an interview about the movie from Caracas or something, they have to tell me before, okay, don't say these words, don't mention so much about the movie and the torture, because like we don't want to get tomorrow them on our doorsteps and shutting us down like that's the reality that's that's lived in Venezuela with with fear um there's been cycles in our last two decades of like moments of a lot of protests and people hit the streets and and and, and it feels like something's gonna happen the bubble's gonna burst and the international community is there but then you know that can't be sustained forever and we don't quite get there and then it dies down for a while and something like COVID happens and everything calms down and then there's a lot of also cynicism or apathy or just you know hopelessness for a bit because it's hard to always keep believing that we're going to achieve it and we're going to be free and then and then it doesn't happen and that's part of like you know these cyclical parts of the histories of, of countries but um and there's been worse moments and less worse moments so you know the movie plays mostly in reference to 2017 and it was like the biggest year of protests millions of people on the street but also shortages of food medicine electricity you know people i think on average you know the entire country lost many pounds of, of weight just on average just because like um and now the economy has been dollarized since so that's helped and it's like the venezuelans outside the country are a little bit sustaining the venezuelans inside the country um but it's still we're still in it like like i told you they just arrested five days ago a journalist for tweeting something uh, last month, it was in the news, John Alvarez, a student, they wanted to make him sign something just like the movie. And now he lost his eyesight on his left eye and has kidney problems from the torture. And that's just like one out of um, the, the most, the toughest thing about this movie, or one of the toughest things right now has been screening it and being in all the screenings in many countries. You know, I've been, I don't know, 15 countries, every single screening I've done, there's been somebody that's been tortured. So it's like not this insane, unique story about this one guy. It's like in every screening, there was somebody who said, I was arrested. Yeah, I was there for two weeks and they tortured me. And then this in every screening, um, let alone somebody who lost a family member or separated families or or whatever. So, yeah, it's still the it's still the day to day. Let's say. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, creating creating the uh, feature, because I know it started life as a short film um, and also uh what parts are based in truth? Did like how many uh, Simones did you speak yeah. with? Okay, so so the short I started writing in 2017, just because it was my thesis project, graduating film, and I wanted to like how can I contribute to this fight while I'm away? So that was like my way of doing it. And then when I saw the reactions of people, like how much it meant to them, even in a 26 minute short, I'm like, all right, I think this is gonna be my my feature. I I have to make this. Um, so. At that point, I already talked to a couple of guys, but then I talked to more, you know, it was kind of organic, just people I would mean into because I would go to protests of stuff that would happen and see this guy and he was like, oh, this is another Simon and just like get to know him and then tell him I was making the movie and just wanted to like hear his story, and especially for the emotional stuff. I mean, there was a lot of, or being men as well, and you just know so many stories already, like you have details of a lot of stuff, but emotionally, it was great to be able to talk to my characters in real life and like, it's been six months since you left. How do you feel now? What do you want to do? And what's going on in your head? um so so to 
basically the construction of the you know i'm very much like a writer like that reverse engineer so i have i had like the objectives like there's definitely a informational aspect to it, like what are the key points i need to inform for somebody who doesn't know venezuela as a country like where what are the key things so that needs to be in there but then i want to say something relevant to venezuelans not just like oh we know what's going on it's like something emotion it's more emotional for venezuelans it's maybe more informational for um for foreigners obviously trying to combine both so that everybody not just venezuelans feel something when they when they watch the movie um so yeah it was just constructing it around that so i these guys i interviewed got their I, I just constructed many many anecdotes like all the tortures were stuff either read or somebody told me about like the domino the orange juice that was a poem i read for a gallery here in miami that was of ex-political prisoners using art to be able to like express their stuff so it was just a, a little poem i read on the wall and it was like mentioned this being drenched in juice so the mosquitoes would tear them apart and i was like oh my god but as a writer i was like this is amazing i would never have come up with this <laughs> but horrifying um so yeah just getting all these details um and structurally did you um was the nonlinear structuring your original screenplay or is that yeah, something yeah, that always, happened in post always no 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 always uh it's all in the script especially well again it's like <laughs> i want to make a movie about venezuela and about what's happening but i need to shoot it outside the country because we are scared to go shoot like one of the producers, Marcel Raskin, he has a production company in Venezuela. He's done many stuff. The moment he read the script, he's like, we can't shoot. Like, we can't go there with the fear. Like, we're going to get arrested at any point or like something's going to happen. Um, so just that alone logistically is already, okay, I'm telling a story from outside in. So it's going to be there. But I needed enough key moments of what happened there. To, so it was always a back and forth. And you know, the structure of it is basically the asylum process as a forced therapy. You know, you have to sit and like, all right, describe in detail what is the most traumatic thing that happened to you to justify being here. So that was giving me the narrative structure to, okay, go back and forth um, and slowly reveal what it is that made Simone, you know, basically break him. I, the scene with the the guard um, where he talks about basically the, the f futility of all of it, you know, how nothing will matter and nothing will make a difference. I think that that resonates throughout the world right now, really, in in so many respects. So, I mean, where do where do you land in in all of this? Like, do you do you think that? I mean, the film, without giving anything away, does provide some hope, which is nice. Well, it's it, that's also interesting because, um, I mean, this is not more personal taste. I love films that are kind of open ending open-ended and not super decisively conclusive um so that's just a personal thing but also i think you know the ending i wanted to reflect the country too which is like it's inconclusive where the fight is still going on and what are we going to do about it but it's been interesting to see the audience and and comments i see online and stuff like some people come out really hopeless some co people come out really defeated i think it's a you know it's a super big hit um to see everything we've done and like that we're still here and sort of that is the intention of like the movie tr tries to maybe also show the mechanisms through which they instill fear and hopelessness in us of like it's not gonna make a difference and you're gonna be an idiot in jail rotting well and that's what's happened you know and i have friends who was four years in prison and tortured and then we're still here um so it feels like what was that for and and that's and, and that's what he says is the most important thing that we just have to keep going to make sure that it all wasn't for nothing you know yeah. if we stop it does feel like what what was the point um but i mean me personally i've never never and will never like lose hope and just and just i mean very put very simply it's it's the cycles of history like germany chile argentina the u.s like everybody's been through so it's the the terrifying thing it could be 250 years or it could be 10 years or it could be six months or tomorrow something happens and obviously you want to push for it to be tomorrow or today and not in 10 years um but you know i think it's inev inevitable that change will occur but it's just a matter of of, of when and and every day that passes it's just more people suffering more families apart more people dying uh so you want to push for it to to come sooner rather than later and, and in part the movie i made it thinking of the Venezuela, which is maybe until a couple months ago, but has been like plateaued in terms of energy level and enthusiasm. 
I've spoken to to guys there. Like the youth is super apolitical. Like they're mm-hmm. just trying to like get about their business and like be entrepreneurs or something. Cause it's like, it's too much. It's too heavy to this constant um, reminder and they want to live their lives too, which is fair. Right. And I think that's part of the difficulty of the, which is part of the movie, the difficulty in the balancing, where is my right to life, my right to prosperity and like seek opportunities and the responsibility of the collective of of my society, of my country, of my culture and balancing those two things. And, and it's been incredible to also see the level of vulnerability in these um, Q and A's. And when I do the screenings of like, everybody just kind of sharing that and then they've struggled for years with the guilt of having left, but now they've whatever and all this stuff, it's been really powerful. You know, you're in a unique position for me to ask this question because you left Venezuela when you were 15 and you came here to the United States and um, the United States, not just on the right, but on the left as well, seems to be showing a, an erosion of our freedoms. How are you feeling moving to a country that used to be known for its freedom and watching what's been happening? Yeah, it's well, it, it's like the movie gains another level of like also a cautionary tale that democracy is fragile and it's you can't just take it for granted. And, and you know, well, you come to a country that has so many great things, but what almost to its own fault of so many great things of like getting used to something and not even having enough uh, recent history to remember when that wasn't the case, you know, because, you know, um, so to think this is automatic and this is just the way things are and that things can can happen and it won't erode democracy and won't erode freedoms. And um, and I think Venezuela is a particularly good example because it's not a country that's always struggling. In, you know, in the 70s and 60s, it was like the booming thing in, in Latin America with all the oil and it was just thriving, uh, a strong democracy. And then how quickly you turn into like misery, like no food, no electricity. And uh, we still have the largest oil reserves in the world. So it's like, it's so ironic. That was when, when I went, uh, yeah, just the image. It's almost like if this was in a movie, it would almost be, it would be bad screenwriting because it's too obvious, but like the image of the gas stations broken down and on the streets, people selling gasoline brought in from Colombia in water bottles. So it's like the image of like the country with the largest oil reserves in the world can't even like have its own gasoline that we have to like people sneak it in from Colombia and sell it in in water bottles to put in your in your car it's like that image that would be like a tacky script it's like all right it's too on the nose but that's literally the same reality again. yeah i i want i want to um for a second uh, uh applaud the casting especially of um the actor who played simone uh fantastic choice i also appreciate that the film never uh went to that love story place it just <laughs> focused on his struggles you know what i mean like you didn't give yeah. in to the Hollywood must have, a, even though there was something there, you weren't yeah. sure whether there was something there. Yeah, I yeah, I wanted to treat them as like, look, he's, you know, he was an activist, a diehard activist who's like broken. So when, when it begins in Miami, he's like at zero. And then how do we slowly like build him back up again? And Melissa's kind of the opposite where she's like, got all the enthusiasm in the world and like kind of wants to help, but like doesn't really have the same thing Simon has where it's like, this really means something to me. You know, she's, I think, looking for that. And through him starts to like realize what an activist is and like what it means to sacrifice something for for and put yourself in you know yourself on the line for something so you know they had like in inverse arcs and i like that that it's almost like just because they're like attractive uh male female like automatically we like kind of like put put them together in our heads but yeah i didn't want it to to be about that also, it's just very, de- like, yeah, she's like helping him with his asylum stuff. It's all very traumatic. Like, and then the, let's make out a little on set. Although I did shoot a kissing scene. Like I, I did want to ask that. Do- yeah. When, well, like when he, when he finally, like towards the end, um, when he's out and they hug, like in the script, there wasn't a kiss. I'm like, it's not going to be, but let me save the editor. Like, let me give myself a choice. And like, so I just have them kiss and like, I'll have it. And then, but then in the end, I'm like, nah, nah, nah. It's it's not about that. It's about Joaquin and Chucho. It's it's not about them. And it's all it also allows your um your queer viewers that ambiguity that well you never know. Yeah. Um, there, was, there there was I I felt an element of that, but you know then people are always reading things into things. But you you allowed for that, which I think is nice. 
Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, any... was, well, it's funny you mentioned that because there was like more stuff sprinkled in there. There was like actually Melissa with uh, another girl, some something that was sort of there, which was supposed to also throw us off because we were like, that's a thing. We You have a male and a female, so we automatically think they're a hetero and they're going to let go. So there was like a, a thing there, but, you know, it was a very minor thing. And then in the end, I'm like, uh, this is like too many strings that like going out and it, it, I didn't feel it was necessary but yeah there was even like that um because I didn't want specifically it's like male and female here they're they're meant to like have a thing yeah uh any word on a release in the United States so I mean right now distribution so we're we're still in the in our theatrical run uh well I just posted right now in Texas we're in Austin Dallas and and Houston this weekend so but it's been very like progressive because it's like we don't have a distributor this has been us like literally with with the exhibitors with the movie theaters and they see the success it has somewhere else and they call us and then we like give them a movie did you have a uh, an oscar qualifying run though yeah 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 for yeah yeah you, you did so you do qualify yeah, yeah, we were we've been in miami year. for like three months since september 9th uh and it's been in theaters yeah we've been in probably like i don't know 40 theaters across the u.s like well especially in florida all over florida in atlanta in but just Boston. not new york or la uh no okay okay yeah new york and la we haven't done okay um i uh i wanted to ask uh, was there one filmmaker um or film that has inspired you the most for this project i i'd say in general yeah inspired um I mean, pro I mean, tied to this one, like Black Swan is just a movie I love. And there's like all these elements of like, I, I love all these psychological, like surrealists and in, in movies or like, where you know, it's highly subjective filmmaking. So we get to manipulate and distort reality according to whatever the, the character is going through. So Black Swan was referenced. There was more like Black Swanny stuff in the movie, like a, even a little darker stuff that was going on with with Simone, but then that, that also stuff kind of fell away in the edit because it's like, oh, it's not quite the tone of the movie. It's a little less sad. You know, something like, you know, he was like picking at his tooth and then it kind of like shakes and then there's like blood, um, you know, because it's like the PTSD of the, the, the molar pull before, which is very Black Swanee, you know, that scene where she's like, uh, you know, pulling at her nail or something. Uh, so, but that stuff also dropped away, but I mean, Black Swan. Moonlight was a reference for us for this movie just because it's shot in Florida. So it was like taking a look at how, what locations they use and how they, because Venezuela, uh, Miami's got very like electric blues and greens. So it's like, how do they, you know, keep a very poetic and aesthetic Moonlight. Um, but then not talking about this movie, I mean, pro one of the movies I've probably rewatched the most and learned the most from, but it's more comedy is Scott Pilgrim, <laughs> Edgar Wright. Okay. Like, oh my God, that to me is like a master. That was like when I started getting into filmmaking college, and I'm like, yeah, there's probably a week where I just watched it over and over again, 15 times, and just like writing down, like, oh, he put a sound effect there, and like a whoosh, and then the pan, and I think that's the movie I've like singularly learned the most from. I, uh, last question is, uh, what's up next for you? Do you have a a project that you're pushing forward? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I have the idea of. The next movie and it's just a matter of sitting down and, and starting to write it uh because simon has taken over my entire life <laughs> so far and you know at one point last year i'm like i want to start you know and everybody tells you you got to be ready with your next thing when this but i saw like i you know i have to finish delivering simon and we're like a small team this is like an indie film it's three producers we're pushing all this that's happening is us so i i, I have to finish delivering simon and then whatever I'll, I'll get to writing and but i'm excited about that next uh idea just completely different from Simone. is it political i'm curious no no it's it's not like a social justice you know. okay well diego thank you for taking the time out um to speak with us i keep up the fight <laughs> yeah well now phase two for the goyas we'll see um yeah but Break it's like it's, there yeah it's really nice to you have the filmmaking side which is nice that good things happen to your movie but it's when it's so aligned to like a cause for your country, it's like honestly the best thing. Cause like anything good that happens with the movie, it's like making more visible what, what's still happening in our country. And so it's just, it's a very, it's a really great place to be. Where like you're extra motivated to push your own movie. Cause it's like something bigger than the movie. Good for you. Thank you.